Louis Bertus knew that he always wanted to work in healthcare to help people heal. And as a physician's assistant, he was basically following the medical mainstream. But then his wife developed type 2 diabetes, and it forced him to take a hard look at the limitations of the healthcare industry. Because the drugs weren't helping, but her doctors kept insisting that the pharmaceutical route was the only responsible path to take. So Lewis decided to do his own research, which is a phrase that is pretty fraught these days, because it can go into all sorts of directions, and some of them are frankly pretty horrifying. But fortunately, perhaps due to his grounding in medical science and perhaps due to his strong spiritual faith, he struck gold. And once he learned that a whole food plant based diet can actually reverse type two diabetes, he devoted himself to spreading the word and empowering people with the ability to get that diet off the pages of books and off the frames of videos and into their kitchens, onto their forks and into their mouths. So in our conversation, we talk about Lewis's work as a health coach specializing in diabetes reversal. We look at various barriers to change, cultural, biochemical, habitual, and we dive into the primacy of mindfulness as a tool for managing cravings and reducing stress, both as a secular tool, but also one if you have a religious faith that you can bring your religion into it and through a process that he calls stop after we go over into in the podcast and how that process can tap into religious beliefs or simply affirmations in the service of improving and maintaining good health. And we also talk about the challenges of addressing health disparities in historically marginalized communities and the urgent need for diversity in healthcare. That is healthcare providers who look like their patients and who have credibility talking about their lives. Hope you enjoy. So without further ado, Louis Burtis, welcome to the Plant Yourself podcast. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we got we got to talk about a bunch of stuff, but start, uh, I'd love for you to start just introducing yourself. Sure, sure. So, okay, so my name is Louis Burtis. I'm a physician assistant and diabetes reversal health coach. And I've uh, been, been a PA for about going on six years, a health coach for two. And yeah, just... Um, always been excited about teaching people about health um, and reversing <laughs> chronic conditions, you know? Uh huh. Mm. So, uh, <coughs> sorry. Bless you. Um, yeah, yeah. Get it out. Get it out. Yeah. yeah well, yeah, we're going to end up having a consultation. I've been sick for like two weeks. <laughs> oh no. I'm still, I still cough in my sleep and, uh, man, and it's tough. It's, yeah, I would say it's probably that change of weather. Right? I know in North Carolina here, man, it's, it's brutal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll try to keep the coughing to a minimum, even uh, see if I can, um, you know, mute myself if I am uh, dexterous enough. But no um, so you've been a PA for six years and mm -hmm. I know you're, we're going we're to talk about like the work you do coaching people to reverse diabetes. And there's there's a bunch of people listening to this who are like, huh, those two words don't go together. That's like, you know, reverse demolition or like, <laughs> I, I didn't know that was possible. There's a lot of people who are like, yeah, yeah, we, we know we get it. Um, how did you come to be a PA? I'm look, I'm looking at you. I assume you're, you're not in your twenties anymore. You've had some sort of mm -hmm. career already. Yeah. So what can you already, tell us? People your, usually the, tell me I look like I'm in my twenties, man. Like, <laughs> Yeah. No, no, I meant, I meant, the, I meant the wisdom and gravitas. Oh, got you. Good yeah, you could be okay, eighteen okay, yeah, from yeah. just visuals. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Good to hear, man. Well, <laughs> yeah. So it's it's been an interesting journey. I think right out of high school, I knew I was going to go into medical field. Um, but I, you know, I have a very spiritual background. My, my, you know, family grew up in very conservative church, Seventh Day Adventist church. Um, uh -huh. And I. I always felt a spiritual calling too, so I ended up studying theology actually in my undergrad, <laughs> oh, okay. uh, with the idea of becoming a pastor. Um, I always thought I liked the idea of being also um, able to help people in practical ways. You know, like obviously Jesus was known as a great physician, so that's why even at studying theology, I always thought, well, maybe I'll get become a medical missionary. Um, you know, get training in medicine. Uh, upon graduating. Um, I felt more and more convicted about going into medicine, and so, um, you know, long story short, you know, I just felt like a divine path to to becoming a PA. Uh, it was a lot of, a lot, a lot went into that, but yeah, I found out that even with that, with a theology 
bachelor's, I can get a physician assistant master's. You know, they're very, it's a great uh, way to get into medical field because it mm -hmm. accepts all backgrounds. So, you know, got into PA school and yeah, uh, I did find out pretty quick uh, how quickly physicians get burned out in our medical system, uh, which is what inspired me to transition to a health coach. Uh huh. So you were feeling that as a PA? Yeah, big time, man. Um, because another thing, you know, being Seventh Day Adventist, I don't know if you know much about that that uh, faith, but they're very into holistic living. Um, so my parent, my dad was like a you know pescatarian, uh, mom vegetarian for a while. I I became vegetarian um, at a you know in my college years. Went back and forth. So uh, seeing my wife have diabetes um, and go going through the medicines, I'm encouraging her to take the medicines, and she's does, she can't stand them. I'm telling them they work. They're gonna work. Eight years later, medicines aren't controlling her blood sugar levels. Insulin, insulin isn't working. Uh, her diabetes is getting worse. Her symptoms are getting worse. And I'm like, well, if medicine's not doing it, there has to be a natural way, you know. Um, so it was interesting because I saw the same thing happening in my patients, you know, with not just diabetes, you know, but many chronic illnesses. They only get worse with time and medicines seem like a Band-Aid. Usually physicians like me, they think that it's because the patient's not taking the medicine or they're not being compliant with the diet recommendations, but she's following the low-carb diet rec recommendations. She's, she's taking the medicines, and I'm seeing a patient, like a perfect example of all my patients at home, where medicine and conventional dietary recommendations are failing her. Um, so I went into a deep dive research for about two years uh, of reading nutritional articles and, re and, and, and um, re um, research on diabetes and nutrition, knowing there's ha they got to be a way naturally. Um, I felt really deeply convicted about it. And I found that uh, very quickly that a low fat, whole food, plant based diet can reverse diabetes. And it's been done and it's been known for about 100 years and no one <laughs> it is not mainstream uh, uh, knowledge. I'm like, this is crazy. Like, this is something people have known. It's nothing new. Uh, you know, I'm not discovering the wheel like like this is, so. Uh, yeah, I quickly had my wife adopt that and six weeks, my friend, she was off medicine. Six mm -hmm. weeks after eight years of struggling, I was like, I was like wow. I got I got to let my people know. So obviously it transitioned to everything I knew and, and thought about medicine. Mm -hmm. So that's so interesting that you're like pushing the party line of, you know, the drugs are going to work. And if they're not working, it's it's your fault as the patient. Yeah. Like, you're not doing something right. And then to be to kind of pull back the curtain in your own home and yeah. see that, boy, that blaming the the patient Yes. First of all, it doesn't seem accurate. Yeah, it does. Like even even if we're accurate, like even if it's true, like oh they're not taking like you know I know the the compliance rate for like a lot of drugs is like under fifty percent, especially like yeah, oh, you know, yeah, blood pressure sure. drugs or diabetes drugs or sure. you know um, blood th you know uh, high blood pressure all that stuff all those things yeah but st but still like the medical profession basically has a superiority complex around like they're stupid or they're lazy the or they're yeah. they're irresponsible and not really asking like why are you not like what's the experience you're having yeah. and, and really yeah, not trusting people it's sad i mean there's been st surveys that um shouldn't be shocking but you know uh where doctors and nurses have have said that when someone's obese or or diabetic they are look they don't they judge them um negatively uh, those for a lot of physicians are the most frustrating patients, you know, in their opinion. And um, some physicians, you know, yeah, there's just a lot of judgment. There's a lot of judgment. You think that the medicine's going to work, and if it's not working, it's your fault. Yeah. But in their defense, right, I did not know anything. I wasn't taught about nutrition in school. You know, uh, we didn't have much nutrition courses in, in my program. So all we are taught for all our years, obviously, if you're a PA for the two or three years of your master's program or a doctor for your six, seven years of education, all you're taught is medicine. So um, it kind of makes sense that they think that way. Unfortunately, I don't give them too much rope <laughs> because the, the research is out there. It, 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 just a quick Google search and you could find a lot of information. 
on lifestyle and disease prevention and reversal. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So look, can you talk about your wife's experience over over those uh, few weeks? Oh, yeah, sure. So she was actually coming off a keto diet. <laughs> so, OK. Uh, and it was interesting because it's a last it was like the last draw. Like we were vegetarian, vegan, I should say. And the only thing that was controlling her medicine was low, low, extra low carb, you know, going down to uh, uh, 20 to 40 carbs a day and the rest of her nutrients coming from meat, dairy, eggs, cheese. So she was finally keeping her blood sugars under control. Uh, we knew that it's not, this is not going to be sustainable because with the blood sugars dropping, the, the liver uh, inflammation, the signs of liver inflammation started showing up in the lab work. You know, um, her cholesterol levels started to, to rise. We knew that, you know, keto or, or, or low carb diets, they may control your blood sugar, but it comes at a sacrifice long term. So um, when she's transitioned, you know, she was really excited. She was really happy to go back to eating, uh, trying out again, you know, because in previous times vegetarian wasn't enough. Um, because a lot of people think, well, I'm a vegetarian. Why is my blood sugar? Uh, why am I, you know, my blood pressure high? Why is my blood sugar high? And a lot of times, it's the fat percentage. So that's what we focused on during those six weeks, um, measuring her fat intake with while being plant based, and eliminating processed foods, um, and keeping it at ten to fifteen percent was the ideal uh, percentage for my research. So, yeah, she was. It was not hard for her. You know, as I'm sure it's been hard for a lot of my clients who have been have never been vegetarian. Mm. It wasn't hard for her. She made the switch like that. Um, interesting enough, some clients I have, it, it just takes days or weeks. But for her, we ha I had to encourage her because like it's three weeks, four weeks, five weeks and the sugars are still not controlled. And she's like, Lewis, this is not working. Right. I said, just keep up, baby. Just, it's going to work. Persist. You know, some people it takes time. You've had diabetes for eight whole years it's not going to go away overnight and that's the thing that you have to be patient with the change in lifestyle it doesn't happen quickly uh so yeah uh six weeks later she started seeing perfect blood sugars um she had dropped her meds i mean i think even before the six weeks but her sugars were finally within normal range in mm -hmm. that six week mark and yeah that's when we knew okay. this is it <laughs> you know and how long ago was that so that was actually the start of our business. So uh, the two years, you know, about two years ago. Yeah. Uh huh. And yeah. so she's she's. If you looked at her today, you like you looked at her labs and and how she, like does it look like she has diabetes that's under control or that she Abs just doesn't Abs doesn't have absolutely. it anymore? Yeah, absolutely. Looking looking at her lab work, her you know just even her physical appearance. She she lost a lot of weight. Um, that's another big part of it is, you know, getting exercise regularly, um, getting that energy back. Um, she was able to go into the gym regularly, uh, her, her, her transformation physically and biologically, you know, has been, you know, a 180, <laughs> really. Yeah. Gotcha. So so in some ways, um, it's it's easy. It's easier to work with, you know, your life partner. But in some ways, it's harder. Like, oh, yeah. you know, it's harder to coach. <laughs> Your, your family. You know, you've got skin in the game. They they wonder like, what are your motives here, or who are you know who are you to tell me, or you know, like how how did you discover that you wanted to do coaching, as opposed to um, medical, the medical mm -hmm. model you'd been trained in? Yeah, it's interesting you say that because yeah, um, my wife doesn't listen to me. <laughs> she, she always. Uh, she always knows better. I'm the one listening to her, you know. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> uh, you know, yeah. Of course, family could be the wor the hardest to work with, and it was it was definitely tough. Uh, and it's always it's you know it's, but it's interesting because, I, I felt really like I was saying in the beginning like unfulfilled. I think there's a survey that says over fifty percent of physicians are burned out, mm -hmm. right? Um, I remember, I remember uh, during my preceptor, uh, my my rotations, I had a, a preceptor that, you know, we're going through the rounds and listening to our heart rate, you know, and and using our stethoscopes to listen to patients, you know, and uh, coming out of a patient's room, I asked her, did you notice that patient had a, a a slight murmur? And she's like, you know, honestly, Lewis, I don't even listen anymore. <laughs> I'm like, what? <laughs> 
So, like, you know, there's a lot of physicians, you know, I think the reason why it's easy to transition to being, for me, is because I know I'm doing something that's going to work. You know, it's, it's, it's hard because a lot of people get into medicine wanting to make a change. They want to see, transform, they don't want, they want to save lives, transform people's life, uh, uh, long, you know, give people longevity. And to see that it's not happening, um, it can be very frustrating. So when I found out that not only can I just maintain, but I can actually reverse diseases, it's all I'm about. And so not just in my practice, but also in my business, I'm able to give people the advice they need. But not just that. When you when you're in a health coaching setting, you're getting to know your patient intimately. You're getting to see them weekly instead of every three months or six months, right? You don't you go from having a 15 minute visit to a, a 45 minute visit. There's so much more you can do as a coach that physicians are limited, you know, uh, in their ability to do because they just don't have the time. Uh, knowing and doing is two different things. So you can get you could tell people what to do, but showing them and guiding them through the process, that's powerful, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. Now, w- one thing, though, you can say about, um, you know, the mainstream traditional medical care is if the, if the person just saying, well, you have this condition, you know, it's probably genetic or we don't know why it happens, but here's the meds. There's a way in which that can feel like it's it's kind of neutral. It's you're not blaming the person. You're not saying, you know, like but when you come around and you say actually it's the food, like you're telling people you can change it. People can also hear it's my fault. Mm, right? How how do you how, how do you help, how do you come across saying, you know, there's power here in a way that people don't feel, you know, judged or judged. start feeling like, "Oh my god, I, you know, what have I been doing to myself or Mm-hmm. Or getting even getting yeah. angry, yeah, that's that's a good point, man. Um, you know, I never thought of it that way, but I guess the approach I take to help, uh, you know, with that that feeling of of self judgment is to, and I can't remember who who coined the phrase, but I, I tell my uh, patients and clients that we live in a toxic food environment. Mm-hmm. Um, it is not your fault. It's the environment we live in. You know, we are oversaturating calories. Processed foods are cheaper than healthy foods. Because of course, corporate interests. Um, you know, we're not. You're not. We're not given the proper education on how to eat healthy. You know, uh, and so it is. It is not your fault. It's the environment we live in, and so it's very. No, we diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol is very normal in this society. Uh, you know, because of this environment, again, this toxic food environment we're living in. So you, but we're, we're, we're reestablishing a new norm, you know. And so I think my patients, you know, uh, they, they, tend to under, they tend to accept that a lot readily than, yeah, this is your fault and you're just been eating bad. And when you think about it, it's like, well, I'm not eating any different than anyone else is eating. Um, and it's unfortunate, yeah, genetics does uh, load the gun, <laughs> as they say, but lifestyle pulls the trigger. And some people's genetics, you know, they're not as uh, friendly towards this this normal way of living uh, in our in our society today. Um, so, you know, when people get that, I think it's easier for them to not feel so bad about themselves, mm-hmm. not feel so judged, you know, when they realize, OK, yeah. well, wow, this is something that happens to many people and I'm not any different than anyone else. Yeah. So did you have to kind of become a, a bit of a revolutionary or, you know, like like once you burst this bubble, like, you know, oh, you know, American capitalism. Great. We have all this food. It's the best in the world. Every, it's all consumer driven choice. And then you start, you know, you, the, some of the things you mentioned, like processed food is, is cheaper than the food, yeah. the same food before it's processed. And they're like, <laughs> yeah. like, like there's some fix here. Like, did you was there a point at which you're, you're like, what the? What the yeah, heck? You know, what kind of world do I live in? Yeah, it's education, it's education, it's knowledge. It's 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 a knowledge we need, you know. And as a, the more I read, the more I start thinking about things. I think people are realizing this though. I, you have a conversation with anyone in the street, and they get it. They are like, yeah, um, that the, these corporations, this big big food, big pharma, has a lot of influence. Um, and obviously, they're in it for the uh-huh. money. I mean, of course, I mean, you can't wrong them, really. <laughs> uh, and so, right. um, unfortunately, like the Bible says, the love of money is the root of everything evil. So you follow the money, you follow, you're going to find the evil. <laughs> and so, 
Yeah, I think um, it's, I do have to be, it, I, I, that's the exciting part. I do see myself as a revolutionary, I, you know, telling people, you know, to, that we need to change things. We need, we need, really need to change things in America. And unfortunately, you know, it's being influenced uh, by many places in the world. One thing that's really sad I tell people is, you know, um, we spend more money in healthcare than any country in the world. And yet, healthcare is a third leading, I think actually the fourth leading cause of death in America. Third mm -hmm. or fourth. People don't know that. Like, <laughs> um, so we're spending all this money. And then on top of that, when, you, when we look at our healthcare qualities, uh, we're, one of the, we're, we're not top. We're, we're somewhere on the 38th or 40th in the world. Yeah, yeah. We're in the bottom. Of developed countries, we're on the bottom. So why are we spending more money than any country in the world, yet we're on the bottom of the list in quality, and our methods are not working, you know? So something's got to change, <laughs> you know? We, got, we have to be, as Martin Luther King says, we got to be the change we wish to see in the world. So, you know, it starts with me. It starts with, with uh, you. It starts with all of us saying, okay, I can't change you or I, I'm the neighbor or, or my friend or my family, but I can change myself, you know? <laughs> So we all, we, 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 we need all to be revolutionaries in a sense, you know? Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Now, you know, whoever you work with, if they, if they have a connection to a culture, they're going to have resistance, right? Oh, Cause yeah, the, yeah. you know, the food culture of, of every ethnic group, you know, ha like celebrates, you know, some kind of decadent cake or meat or cheese dishes. And mm -hmm. it can feel like, you know, someone's trying to, you know, like, you know, what are you trying to give me, you know, quinoa and broccoli? Yeah. Like that's not culturally yeah. appropriate. Yeah. It doesn't fill me. It doesn't provide me with comfort. There's no, uh, you know, associations with, with family and grandma. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. do, do you find that in your work? I, I uh, yes and no. Uh, Cause like I do find a lot of cultures outside of American culture, a lot of ethnicities, you know, they do tend to have a lot more plant-based foods in their diet. So I think the, the most, the hardest ones are like kind of like the, you know, uh, traditional Southern, you know, <laughs> you know, uh, 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 culture, you know, but you know, ethnic, as far as when you leave the, when you leave America, there's a lot more plants in there and, and other ethnic, ethnic cultural foods. Um, but even there, you're right. You know, when you know when you're talking to any, of any culture, there's going to be some foods that have to change that are f they're familiar with that bring that feeling of home. <laughs> but so what I encourage them is that you you can still enjoy those foods in moderation, right? It's not an all or nothing thing. That's the one thing that scares people. They feel like, oh well, if I don't do it 100 percent, then it's not going to work, but no, it's not an all or nothing thing. The closer you can get to a whole food plant-based diet, the better, right? But it's not all or nothing. It's not like, you know, uh, um, you can never enjoy those favorite foods again. But what you want to learn to do is not need them. Hmm. You want to get to the point where, you know, you're making a, a conscious choice to have them, not a biological drive, right? You want to remove the addiction. Who wants to be addicted to anything, right? So with time, with patience, you could cut the cord of addiction. And then now I choose to have chicken on Thanksgiving. It's not because I must, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so that's part of it. But also you could, there's so many alternatives. There's so many ways to enjoy some of your favorite pastries and make them vegan, you know, um, and some of your favorite foods and just transition them slightly. Uh, traditional uh, cultural dishes that can be vegan uh, very easily, you know, so, um, and then having them actually try out the, the uh, cultural recipes that are, that are transitioned to become vegan recipes and, and they see, wow, I can enjoy, uh, I can still have fun with my food, you know, and, and be plant-based, absolutely 100%. If you're, if you're not enjoying the plant-based food or the diets uh, that come with it, or the recipes that come with it, you're not doing it right. Because <laughs> I'm big on you should be enjoying your food and you can, you know, you can. Right on, right on. Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to keep uh, peppering you with the objections. <laughs> so, yeah, sure. Yeah. So <laughs> the, the biggest objection I found for people who, you know, are, are tired of, the, of diabetes management the medical way is that when you then say, OK, well, you've got to eat like fruits and vegetables, right? That they're like, oh, I, but I can't. 
like that's going to make it worse. Like everything I've been taught is low carb. Yeah, yeah. Right. That's, so yeah, that's a big how, one. How, how do you help people, you know, break their addiction to, you know, adhering to this medical model that even though it hasn't worked for them, mm -hmm. still feels like mm -hmm. it's too dangerous to give up. Give up, yeah, yeah. So yeah, that that is hard because they they you know, there's a lot of re-education that has to happen. A lot of re-education. So, um, I think the proof is a lot of times is the testimonials. You know, when when you see, when you see people who have been plant based and they're off their medicine, you can't argue that. Like, wow, how come they're getting results and look at how all the carbs they're eating? Um, and you can anyone anyone can research that online. Look, uh, there's there's so many testimonials. You know. Um, not just in my business, but in others who are doing mastering diabetes is huge. They have a huge list. I love watching their videos. Who people who are doing it are probably seeing seeing is 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 like almost ninety hundred percent of believing, right? So see, watch watch the stories of others who have turned plant based and have better lab work than you, and then tell me that low carb is the way, you know. Um, but not so not just that the second thing would be science just the the science behind it so i do get i get a lot into the science of diabetes reversal and when you see it it's very clear that it is saturated fats particularly but high fat diets that cause insulin resistance which is keeping sugars trapped in your blood once once you drop that fat percentage you could increase your tolerance for carbs you'll see that diabetics can eat more carbs than they ever had and have normal blood sugar levels. And there is a science behind it. And um, so it's, 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 it's a fat, you know. What happens when someone takes insulin? They gain weight. Why? Because the insulin is driving fat into the tissues not designed to store it in excess amounts. So when you, when you realize that, you realize, well, maybe it isn't the carbs. Um, and it really isn't the carbs. Um, and so, yeah, um, it does take a lot of motivating through um, actual testimonials and a lot of educating through helping them see the science, the biology behind insulin resistance, what insulin does in the body, how high fat diets can drive and make it harder to to respond to it. And that blood sugar levels being high is just a side effect. You know, it's not it's not the cause. It's the side effect of diabetes, you yeah. know. So what, one of the problems, I think, is that there's a there's a lack of nuance in how mm -hmm. the popular media and influencers and even the medical profession and the, you know, the mainstream media talk about food in terms of, you know, low carb, low fat. And like it, it puts it as like fat or sugar, which one is the enemy and carbs yeah. can mean anything from a fresh salad yeah. <laughs> to, you know, a McDonald's Happy Meal. Um, I know, you know, so you're, you're not a fan of sugar, right? No, absolutely not. Yeah. So refined carbs are, you know, are definitely not real food, whole food. So I, that's why I love the term, you know, whole food plant based, because what you want, you want the whole food, not the leftovers of the food um, you want. I like to say you like to you want to eat dollars, not coins. Um, so uh, <laughs> and how I explain that is like. Basically, when you think of complex carbs, they're dollars, right? And the refined, highly processed, uh, refined carbs or sugar is coins. So if I were to ask you, you know, to that or to tell you that you can only hold a certain amount of weight in currency every day, would you choose to hold dollars or coins, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> so, no me, brainer, give me, dollars. Give me the paper. <laughs> yeah, the paper is light, right? Yeah. Right, in the sense that whole foods, complex carbs, are full of fiber and, and nutrients that make it um, more fulfilling, right? More satisfying. Um, you're not gonna be as hungry. Um, they fill you up. So it's light. It's, as far as caloric density, it's not high in calories. It's light. Coins or sugar is heavy in the sense that it's full of. Uh, car it's high, highly caloric. More likely to lose weight. Less likely to fill you, right? So. Um, on top of the, uh, so when you think about that, you know, you're going to lose weight, you're going to reverse disease. If you're increasing the amount of dollars, complex carbs, and zeroing out the coins, eating food that's rich in nutrients while low in calories, right, the dollars, while eliminating the, the food that's high in calories and low in nutrient value, right, uh, uh, coins don't go very far. 
So I tell people, eat dollars, not coins. And, and that's why I compare complex carbs and sugar. You know? I love that. I love that. Yeah. Um, what, what can you say about sugar? Because I know a lot, you know, a lot of people I know in the plant based or vegan community, like we'll give sugar like we would never touch a piece <laughs> of <true>. fish. <laughs> but like, you know, like, like here's a whole food plant based recipe. It's a it's, you know, it's a delicious car carrot cake. And yes, it will have, you know, yeah. applesauce instead of oil, but it'll have like three quarters of a cup of sugar. coconut sugar. <laughs> yeah, sugar becomes like the replacement drug, you know. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah, we need something to feel good, huh? So why not sugar? But no, um, yeah, sugar definitely does de de deserve um, its, its um, how you call it, um, attention. You know, we need to pay attention to sugar. Uh, because sugar can, you know, be be a problem. Sugar, can, no, I don't care what anyone says. You eat enough sugar, yes, you can uh, get fat from sugar. Uh, of course, fat is is already fat, so fat's always going to be fattening, more fattening. Uh, but sugar can be a problem. Uh, for perfect examples, that study show that if you overfeed somebody uh, with sugar, like candy and sodas, you'll you can increase the percentage of liver fat by thirty three percent. But of course, you take the same calories and fat, and it can go up by fifty-five percent. Okay, mm -hmm. so yeah, fat versus sugar. Fat is worse. Yes, um, as far as you know, metabolically, and uh, um, and um, of course, all the things uh, and metabolic syndrome. You know, fat's going to be worse. But sugar does not help. I would call, uh, you know, if anything, sugar is a smoldering fire, or fi where fat is a gasoline that makes it worse. Right? Mm -hmm. They can bust together. Yeah. You know, so you know. Yeah, I guess most most of the sugar we consume is consumed with fat, right? Exactly. Right. So Together. it becomes a, a, a kind of a me metabolic priority thing where the mm -hmm. sugar, it's, you know, our bodies will go, oh, sugar, we know how to do this. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Let's use that yep, for yep. energy. And then the fat is just all left over, right? Stored away. So that's why, you know, uh, most of us are struggling to lose weight or, you know, uh, come off our meds because what you're doing is, you know, you're, you're, forcing your body to say, you know what, this inc this fat and sugar, you know, I'm going to use the sugar now and I'll store the fat for later because, you know, we could use the sugar right now. Um, so sugar is, is, is obviously when it's refined. Again, let's let's differentiate between sugar and complex carbs, right? So we're not talking about, when we say sugar, we're not talking about fruits. We're not talking about whole grains, right? We're talking about the highly processed leftovers from those processes, fruit cakes and fruit pastries and fruit juices even uh, uh, things that are left over from the original source of the natural state of that food sugar um, that goes straight to the liver right it almost bypasses <laughs> everything else goes straight to the liver like a like a targeted bomb and now the liver has to process those extra calories it's more likely to, st to store it as fat you know if you have it in abundance right and another thing with sugar is that it doesn't stimulate our our, our, ap our appetite suppressant system, you know. So you can easily. That's why you think about it. You could down a soda and soda, and you have all these calories, but you're still hungry because the sugar doesn't tell your brain to stop. Sugar doesn't tell your brain that hey, you've had enough, you know. So you load up on those calories, those coins, and you're not nutritionally full. There's no value. Hmm. Gosh. And is that is that true of sugar in solid form? as well because I know our body yeah. d d doesn't really register beverages as like calories solid because solid form as well. Yeah, really? solid form as wow, well. I, yeah. I hadn't yeah. heard that. That's it doesn't cool. stimulate the appetite suppressant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so so we've got um, clarity about what people should and shouldn't be eating. And yet when people are under stress is really <sighs> hard to not go for those addictions, to not go for those comforts. What, how, how do you help people deal with that? that that's, the, that's a big one. You know, I mean, when we're stressed, we want to go to the things that make us feel good. You know, we want that dopamine release that makes us feel good from eating sugar or fatty foods. Fatty foods. Um, I think, of course, it does take time. Um, again, it's an addiction you're dealing with, so it's not going to go there. Those cravings uh, and that go-to feeling, um, feeling like you have to go to that go-to is not going to go away overnight. But it takes time and patience. So uh, what, I, what I try to do um, is teach people about mindfulness. Um, and mindfulness meditation is huge. Just the, the practice of not allowing stress to drive you to action. Too many times you go from thinking to doing. Or 
we're ruminating on the past, which causes stress, or we're worrying about the future, which causes stress. To eliminate that stress or minimize the stress, because you're not going to eliminate stress, but to minimize stress, we need to all practice moments of mindfulness. So, um, and it's it's very simple, just being in the present moment, right? Learning to calm our minds and just know the art of being still, right? It's powerful what can happen or what cannot happen when you just pause for a moment, not making a decision, not making, not not allowing your thoughts to dwell on judging judging yourself or others or the situation. And just be, be still, be present in the moment, right? Recognize what you're feeling in your body, in your mind. How, how are these emotions showing up? Live in it. Don't act on it. Just live in it. Embrace it. Don't fight it. And, and embrace and encourage, encourage people to embrace their emotions, right? Um, and very, it's, it's, a, it's powerful. It's, it's amazing how quickly pe- those cravings lose their power. They go away, mm. right? Not to say they're not going to return another day, <laughs> but you can, you can, it's one battle at a time. And you can learn a lot if you learn the practice, the art of mindfulness meditation. How, how do you teach people to engage in mindfulness meditation? Yeah, so um, it's, it's basically a, a principle that I learned from, I can't remember the author, uh, it'll come to my mind maybe, but uh, it's, I, call, I, I call it STOP. So STOP is an acronym that helps you kind of practice mindfulness at any moment. So S is S and STOP is obviously stop what you're doing. Just whatever you, when you're feeling overwhelmed or stressed, just stop, right? Take that moment to take a break, right? The T in STOP is take a break, right? So take a break or, and, and, and take, a, sorry, take a break and take a breath. Sorry, take a breath uh, specifically. And you just, you know, when you're, when you're practicing mindfulness, you're, you're kind of centering your mind on, your breathing, starting with your breathing, because it kind of centers you on what's going on in your body at the very present moment. So taking a deep breath in through your nose and out through your mouth. And just feel that, that, that oxygenation of your lungs, right? Um, the A, acknowledge. Acknowledge that this is a moment where you need to be mindful. This is a moment that you're feeling overwhelmed. This is a moment where you need to be um, aware of uh, what is going on in your body. So acknowledge and awareness is the A. Uh, um, sorry, um, I said A. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was I'm, gonna... I'm mixing, I'm mixing up uh, uh, acronyms, so I, th- I think you do, I think you just jumped into RAIN, right? <laughs> right, yeah, RAIN, yeah. I'm mixing stop and RAIN, sorry. <laughs> okay. So you know the book. All right, so yeah, so going from take a breath, I apologize. O, o <laughs> is, uh, I'm going from stop to RAIN, yeah. RAIN is another, is another way of, of explaining this, but O, okay, so we're, we're, on, so we're on stop, not A, O, <laughs> not RAIN. So O is observation, very similar to the A, actually. It's almost the same. So O is when you're observing, you're going to observation mode right and um so you're observe you're observing what's going on in your body you're trying to um feel what the feeling is right um is it chi- the, sometimes for me i get tightness in my chest so i allow myself to observe that what is that tightness you know feeling um the butterflies in my stomach i observe it i just sit down i sit there and i observe what is going on anytime my mind's distracted i go back to taking a breath Right. Every time I feel my mind wandering, I take a breath and I go back to observing again. What is where is the stress? Where is the emotions going on in my body? How is it showing up in my body? Right. And uh, P, the P is, is, is basically proceed um, and proceed. I like to add, actually I, tra- I, I, I add a little twist to it and say proceed with promise. Mm. Um, I think everyone should have a mantra, a go to saying. Right. Uh, for me, it's uh, he makes all things beautiful in his time. When I when I claim that promise, right, that I believe so strongly in, it empowers me to replace that negative motion, that negative energy, with something positive, right. So proceed with promise. So S, stop, right. T, take a breath. O, observe what's going on in your body. Of course, acknowledge <laughs> uh, that you. And P proceed with promise take a mantra some people um it, for everyone is different you know one, so one of my my last recent client said it, for his it's right thing right now you know proceed with a promise hmm. and that's that's what mindfulness meditation you could do that literally in five in 10 seconds 30 seconds you could do it very fast so yeah. any moment of the day can call for a mindfulness moment yeah so do you have people sit in practice like put it in their calendar or, or 
be because I find like the the irony is the moments that call for mindfulness are the moments that I'm least likely to remember that there's such a thing <laughs> well, as mindfulness meditation. Mindfulness. Trust me, mindfulness is a school you never graduate from. Okay, like, <laughs> you, you you don't get to the point where yes, I am a mindfulness master. You have to constantly remind yourself, right? And you might find yourself, man, I, I should that this morning was the perfect moment to practice it, and I did it. So I mean, I'm I think you know it might be great for people who want to actually dedicate a moment in their day, usually early morning before they start the day, to meditation and practice mindfulness. Uh, but not everyone has those moments, so it's something you have to rem just r continually remind yourself daily. It, like anything, it gets better with practice. The more often and more frequently you do it, right? And that's why I encourage people to do it even when they're not emotional, okay? You can mm. do it when you're happy, right? You, you know, it doesn't have to be when you're upset or sad. It could be when you're neutral, when you're not feeling, you could be feeling like, you know, it's a, it's a pretty okay day. And say, you know what, let me just practice mindfulness at this moment, right? You could do it while you're driving. You could do it while you're exercising. You could do it while you're walking. You could do it at any moment of the day. And the more frequently you're doing it, the more likely you're going to turn to it in mm. moments of stress because it's going to be automatic. Yeah, more I would think that, that if you're only doing it when you're stressed, you're now associating it with a negative. So it's doing yes. it when you're happy Happiest, is probably a better yeah. way to kind of get it into your neural set, uh, exactly, settings. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Very powerful. So, so I'm, I'm curious because you mentioned, you know, the your mantra, um, which seems like it comes from your your faith. And, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I know like in, in the American sort of Christian tradition, meditation really has been sort of oh, yeah. viewed with suspicion. You know, I know mm -hmm. there's, you know, there's contemplation, but the idea of meditation was very much associated with, you know, Hindu gurus and, and, and Buddhas and Shivas. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm mm -hmm. curious how your uh, your faith tradition and your upbringing mm -hmm. connects, because obviously you've connected yeah. it with the mindfulness yeah. meditation. Do they have they supported Absolutely. each other? Was there a point at yeah. which you kind of had to synthesize a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so there's so many scriptural supports for mindfulness. The, the, I think a lot of Christians don't realize they, they support and they agree with the principles of mindfulness and don't even know it. <laughs> um, it doesn't matter your religion, what creed, whatever you belong to, whatever you believe in. Uh, mindfulness is something that you can, you can practice. Uh, the verse that I, I the, my go-to verse is, is the Bible's verse. The Bible says, be still, be still and know that I am God. Hmm. Be still. Right. Um, and it's such a powerful phrase, you know, because our, that's what mindfulness is. It's it's stilling the mind from the ruminating thoughts that are re literally destroying us and, re and reminding us that there is a power greater than ourselves. All right. That things are going to be OK, uh, that you survive this. You survive worse. You know, um, um, and so. It's something that there's so many scriptural supports to, you know. I always like to tell the story of Elijah who, who was running for his life and ended up in a cave uh, wanting to kill himself. He wanted to die. And, um, you know, he, he heard, a, the story goes that he heard the voice of God. It basically was telling, he was telling him that he was going to show up. He was going to show up and show himself. To Elijah, can you imagine? You know the, you know this all, Almighty God is going to show Himself. Man, things going. My problems are really going to be solved now. And uh, the story goes that there was a great earthquake, and Elijah looked for God. He was not in the earthquake. And there was a great fire, and there was a great wind, and God was not in the earthquake. He was not in the fire. He was not in the wind. But the Bible says then there was a still small voice, and that's where Elijah recognized the presence of God. So a lot of times we think it's a revelation, it's something powerful, but God shows up in the small moments. It's in the quiet, it's in the quiet moments of our life that we receive power. Um, and that's what mindfulness is giving us, is telling, getting us to still our minds, still the world for a moment. Be still. And that's what mindfulness is. It's very Christian, <laughs> if anything. <Okay. laughs> yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, I, I can't help but, but hear the the paradox in like there a, you can't have a still voice you either have a voice or you have stillness yeah so so you know the inv the invitation to you know a kind of inner knowing 
you know, mm. and I, I, I've come to mindfulness. I grew up Jewish and I come to mindfulness with a with more of an Eastern mm. bent to it. But I'm but I'm sort of seeing, you know, if if you know, if I am consciousness, um, you know, having, you know, creating a body out of consciousness and, and everyone else is, too, then yeah. that's that's that kind of maps onto, I think, a very traditional uh, Judeo Christian view of God. Yes. Yes. Uh, sort of, you know, not, 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 you know, bearded guy in the sky, uh, <laughs> but kind of a you know, universal consciousness that we're all, we're all part of and is part of us. Yes, yes, that is, that is, that's true, you know, and so that's your, that's where you're connecting to that divine power, you know. Yeah. Um, so what, I don't know, one of the other things that we had talked about talking about that I'm, I'm very curious yeah. about um, is um, your experience with healthcare in terms of diversity and racism um, mm. and, and what's needed there. So obviously we've talked about like healthcare needs to understand lifestyle and diet, um, mm. but there's, all, there's also other issues that, that you've yeah, experienced sure. firsthand. Yeah. You want to talk about that a yeah. little? Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, of course, you know, um, uh, African Americans, and you know, not only, but uh, there is there are minorities in our country that are neglected uh, largely. Not um, you see it in studies. The fact that when it comes to research, uh, a lot, not a lot, not as much is done in our in, in our population. Uh, but also, uh, very soberingly, uh, is that there are many statistics and studies that show that. Even in when it comes to medical practice and medical decision making, that um, the African American population can suffer. Um, then you know, pile that on top of you know uh, maybe uh, disparities you know economically in the you know the food deserts that tend to be. I think it's like eight percent of of um, lower income areas that are or African American areas to say uh, have actually a grocery store in their neighborhood. You know, so there, there's it's a very neglected population. So um, I think that's something that we need to call attention to for sure. Uh, me being African American myself, you know, um, it is nice that I can bring that diversity to the medical field, you know, and encourage the encourage that conversation. Um, and it's amazing how how often I can I could sense the relief when I when I when a, a pa when I sit down and I see a patient that's an African-American and they see that have, they have an African-American provider, there's a relaxation like they say, wow, this is, they're, they're, they're just a, I can't describe it, there's a peace and there's a calm to it, you know, because they're not used to seeing people of my color sitting wearing this jacket, right? And so um, it's been nice to bring that diversity into this field and we need to see more of it, I think, you know, um, especially you know, in, in, all, in all medical fields, um, and practices and specialties, but especially in family medicine, where you turn to someone to be your guide when it comes to health decisions. Um, but yeah, diversity, I think, is something very important we need to see more of. Uh, we need to talk about the disparities more and um, you know, try to see how we can make changes positively. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think representation feels so important because you, you, know, you talked about a lack of representation in studies and part part of that is, I think, due to a, uh, a longstanding and quite justified mistrust of the medical profession in the African-American community. You know, yeah. I remember I was it was 1993. So I was um, 28 when I first heard about the Tuskegee experiments. Yeah, yeah. And this was, you know, like AIDS had been going for a while. And I, and there were, I was in grad school and I had, um, you know, African-American classmates and they were like critical of the U.S. like policy. And I thought like AIDS might be, you know, a government plot. And I'm like, how can you possibly what could you think? And yes. then I'm reading like, oh, like there is a, there is a long history here that I had never been taught. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, you yeah. know, like, I, I get why there is suspicion. And it seems like they you know, injected just, us with syphilis. I mean, come on. How, how can you expect us not to be suspicious? Right. <laughs> Well, I think I think they just I think what I, my, what I uh, understood about it was that it was just you know untreated and doing sham like they hadn't they didn't actually sham, give them yeah, syphilis. Yeah, but they, essentially that's what's happening. Yeah, yeah, not treating the syphilis. Yeah, right, not telling people they have syphilis. It's just like, yeah. ooh, this is cool. Let's yeah, see when they go. Yeah. Like, like just awful. Let's see what let's see what happens. 
Well, yeah, yeah. There's and, a lot of mistrust. Yeah. You know, and so for some for for someone you know who looks like you to come in and say, um, "I'm your advocate. I'm not yeah. here from big pharma, right?" Because there's also like all the people who discover what you've discovered about mm -hmm. lifestyle and diet. Also, some part of their brain goes, wait, the pharmaceutical companies are taking advantage mm -hmm. of us. They're the mm -hmm. ones writing the medical curriculum, yeah. don't, you know, yeah. supporting all yeah. the like. Right. So there's there's a there's a there's huge amounts of mistrust and suspicion. Mistrust. And it feels like mm -hmm. really important for for people like you to be, um, you know, advocating back up uh, up the ladder. As yes, opposed to absolutely. as opposed to yeah. just, you know, um, fulfilling, fulfilling the, yeah. the powers that be uh, mm -hmm. and, and the, yeah. and the, the models that we already have. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's important because um, it's it's harder. I mean, it's harder for anyone to to accept the uh, especially, you know, doctors aren't aren't don't get the respect that they used to. Right. You're, we're not you know, it used to be that, you know, people used to laud a doctor's opinion. Or advice, but not so much. And any says anyone, no matter your culture or your color, people don't tend to trust doctors as much as they used to. You know, they say they no one does. But when it comes to African American culture, yeah, they're even more mistrusting. Um, you know, so they're more. I think they're probably more likely to be skeptical when you say this pill is going to take away my blood, it's going to lower my blood pressure. You know, um, this you know pill is going to help me with my sugars. You know, um, they're 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 they'll accept it, but they'll be a little skeptical. Um, when it comes from, unfortunately, a white face. There's no yeah. other way to say it. <laughs> but um, yeah, so, yeah, I mean, that that's something that I, I, I feel is um, definitely something I feel a call to stay in medicine for. You know, I could always make the transition and leave medicine, but I want to stay here to be a representative of my culture. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I think there's also the issue of like just mirroring, like looking around and seeing whatever you see around you feels normal. Like I've had... Mm -hmm. um, you know, New York City Mayor Eric Adams has been on the podcast twice. He's mm -hmm. he's in uh, yeah. he's in some hot water. Yeah, right now. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, you know, I think his his heart is in the right place around health, and he's talking about mm -hmm. like growing up, and just everybody in his family had diabetes. Yeah, like it yeah. was there. There wasn't even a thought of like, oh, is there something I can do? It's like. You know, the way you the way you think about, oh, there's I, I have old aunts in their 70s. Maybe one day I'll be in my 70s. It was like that yeah, inevitable. Yeah. Yeah. That, mm -hmm. you know, that everyone gets diabetes. And so this mm -hmm. this idea, you know, if you, you come in and say I, it doesn't have to be this way. There, yeah. there must be, um, you know, a pretty a pretty high bar to clear just to get people to, you know, as to proceed with promise, as you said. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Proceed or promise. Yeah, that's right. And so I think that's, what, you know, what, what's unfortunate when you're around, when everyone has diabetes, it becomes normal. You know, mom, dad, you know, when I get it, it's not a big deal because everyone has it. When I want to, whenever around you has high blood pressures on medications, has a laundry list of medications, it becomes a norm. So um, breaking out of that, when you see somebody in the family who's doing something different, right? Someone in your neighborhood, someone on your block, then you realize, wow, there's a different way, you know? Um, so you realize I don't have to. I, I love the eagle and chicken uh, analogy. You never heard that story? <laughs> eagle and no. chicken. So, you know, there's an eagle that thought he was a chicken because he was, grew up with chickens. So he <laughs> ate with the chickens, ran with the chickens, plucked like, you know, plucked like the chickens. And then one day he sees the eagle flying, right? And he doesn't realize, you know, that that could be him until the eagle comes down and shows him how to fly, right? Mm. And you realize all this time he's been an eagle. So, you know, I think we need to see people who are flying. We need to see people who are doing it differently. Then we realize, hey, why not me? You know, I, and, and so, you know, we equate ourselves with our environment. So if everyone else is, our, is struggling, we're going to struggle. And unfortunately, that's what happens. I think this is more about classism even than racism, really. I mean, when you're in certain classes or certain areas, you know, that are struggling financially and, phys and, and, and health wise, you just become, you think that's normal. You think that's just, you just accept it. You don't know any better. But when you see somebody who looks like you, who is like you, and they're doing something better, you know, something different, and it's inspiring, you know, it teaches yeah. you that you can fly, you know. Yeah, and I think it's it's so important, as you know, we start out by talking about your, your role as a coach, that yeah. that all of us, who, whether, whether we're a VA or a coach or whatever, all of us who are living into this, you know, healthy new reality 
adopt a kind of a coaching mindset so that because it's easy to look at someone who's doing something right and go, oh, that jerk. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, oh, or, you know, to like, oh, they're so judgmental. They're always telling me what to do or, mm -hmm. oh, what a goody goody, as mm -hmm. opposed to like, how do we, you know, embody and, and model this healthy way of being in a way that invites, right? How do you yes. be the second eagle? Yeah. That doesn't yes. make the first eagle go, get out of here. You know, <laughs> like, yeah, don't you're give just me showing ideas. off. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I think that's that's the power of being a coach because you become more, um, you become friends, right? And someone's more likely to take the advice of a friend, I think, even than even a professional, you know, at times, at times. <laughs> but, you know, when, when, when they see you kind of come down to their level, you know, when, you, when you're a coach versus putting on the white jacket, right? Um, as a coach, you re, you're, you're, coaching is about coming alongside of you and walking with you and not just leading you, right? So a coach is going to say, hey, yeah, I know I've been there, you know, I, I've been through that. I know, I know that struggle, right? Um, I think a coach can only be successful. He struggled the same way. I know, you know, and I'm sure you're, you know, you know the struggle. You've been through that struggle yourself, right? You know what it means to be overweight, to struggle with food cravings. Uh, to, to the lack of knowledge, you were there. And so it's, it becomes um, more you taking their hand and reassuring, the, reassuring them that, it, that I was there yeah. and I was in your shoes and I know it can be done. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's, I, I've, I've come to think it's more general than like I can coach people on things that I have not struggled with mm -hmm. as long as I come across as a as a vulnerable human being. Yes. Right. So it's not necessarily that, oh, I have to have weighed 420 pounds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But like, yeah, I, I have I have been overweight. I have been addicted to junk food. But I can mm -hmm. also coach someone on something else by saying, yeah, this is like life is hard. Like this is yeah. this is not this 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 incarnation is not for sissies. Yes. <laughs> like, yeah, I get like I'm not judging you. I get it. You know that your body and your mind has reasons for all mm -hmm. the things you're doing that it doesn't that you think you shouldn't be doing like they're yeah, yeah. it's trying to protect you it's trying to keep you safe it's trying like if you, you're talking about like the meditation like mm -hmm. stop and feel this oh, these butterflies like i would rather eat chocolate than feel butterflies yeah right i don't need yeah, right i got enough I problems i don't need butterflies too <laughs> right yeah, it's scary. It's scary to yeah people people is having to pause and feel what they're feeling. It can be scary, you know. Uh, but yeah, you're right. Um, I think that whenever you're 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 thinking about the the fact that you're a human, it qualifies you. <laughs> yeah. I'm qualified to talk about this. Why? Because I'm human. Because <laughs> you know, uh, I struggle. We all struggle, and we're you know being able to walk this path together. You know, um, as the saying goes, you know, you want to go. Uh, uh, far, you know, so if you want to go um, fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go with someone else, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. I love that. It's, it's, it's so much easier when you're someone. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Hey, how can people find you? Who, who should reach out to you? How, 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 if someone's listening and they're like, I'm not mm -hmm. sure if uh, Lewis can help me. Yeah. Who, yeah. How, how do people think about that and how do they get in touch with you? Sure. So um, diabetics, of course, um, whether you're type one or type two, and you're looking to lower uh, your medications or come off them completely, uh, then yeah, I, I would be the person that can help you do that. Uh, but also anyone who is you know struggling with transitioning to a whole food plant-based diet for weight loss uh, or coming off med blood pressure medications, cholesterol medications. Um, I have worked with people who, have, who are on the verge of dialysis, kidney failure. What I love about this lifestyle, it, it cures, it, it basically, it can reverse or, or prevent 95% of chronic illnesses. So if you're looking to come off medicines, yeah, I, I'm, I'm the one. But diabetes is what I specialize specifically in, yeah. <laughs> okay. And do you work yeah. with people in person or online? Good question. All online. So uh, I have a virtual platform and we meet once a week uh, for three months and with a possibility to extend if people need to, but a minimum of three months that we work uh, together online. Gotcha. And how do people find you? All right. So um, you can find me on my through my website, Lewis. It's easy, LewisBurtis.com. All right. Uh, you better spell that because it's 
Yeah, Mother. that's probably. There's, yeah. Lo- there's a lot of Lewises out there. That's, and that's Bert- true. That's Bertus true. is not the most so, common name. That Bertus is not the common name. So Lewis spelled like the English L E W I S. Last name is Bertus B E R T U S B E R T U S. Lewis Bertus. And you could also find me on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. I'm on most of the platforms. Um, if anyone wants to reach out by email, it's simple too. Lewis at LewisBurtis.com. Lewis at awesome. LewisBurtis.com. That's it. Awesome. Yeah. So I'll, I'll drop this in the show notes as well. So yeah. if people want to want to click the link, they can find you there. All um, right. Awesome. Lewis, thank you so much for taking the time. This has been a really fun conversation. I, I find my yes. I find my like jaws hurting a little bit because I feel like I've been oh. smiling a lot. So oh yeah yeah, it was good. That's good. Like, uh, <laughs> you you you, um, you transmitted some some great spirit to me. I appreciate that. I appreciate that, man. So um, I just thank you for the opportunity uh, to talk with you. I don't know if we le- if I left you the link for the free recipes. I don't know if I gave you that for people oh, who want no, free recipes. Can, uh, um, I can. Should I give it to you in the chat here? So well, I know on your on your website there's a um, there's an offer for, for, for yeah. Like, there should be offer. Yeah, yeah. I have two hundred eighty free recipes. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. On my Facebook page specifically, if anyone wants free recipes, they can join. They can look at it on my Facebook page. Uh, so find me on there. The name of the business is Diabetes 180. Oh, right here. <laughs> but um, yeah, my, you could probably find me quick with my name last, first and last. Okay. But I, I, yep, they can get free recipes if they're interested in Great. and starting just, it off on their own. T- yeah. <laughs> tease us, tease us with uh, two or three of your favorite recipes. Just what they're called. Oh yes, I I love um, I love my chili bean soup. Oh man, that's <laughs> uh, that's one of my go-to's, uh, especially in these cold times. Uh, so. Um, and then, uh, man, there's so many that I like. Um, so for me, one thing I, I always go to because I'm really pressed with time is my tofu salad. Oh my goodness, yeah, it's it's good. <laughs> okay, yeah. is that cold? Yeah. Cold, yeah, I prefer cold, yeah. But you know, it's good, good and warm. If you, it's getting warm, cold outside, so I might warm up, you know, stir fry the tofu first. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So chili, chili beans. Uh, yeah. Is it super stew? A stew, yeah, stew, yeah. All right, so and mm. tofu yeah. salad, both they both sound yeah. very comforting and yes, uh, filling. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, Lewis Burtis, thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you for all you do. It's been great yes. getting to know you. All right, likewise, man. Yes, thank you so much. Okay, peace. Peace. And that's a wrap. Show notes at plantyourself.com/slash six zero eight. Good weekend. We had our um, Bravas Ultimate Tournament, the fundraising tournament for uh, for the whole club team, the Porro in uh, Castel de Fels Beach. And people came from all over the world. It was a hat tournament. So your name got thrown into a hat, more or less. And uh, some people on my team were from Italy, Germany, Czech Republic, um, Egypt, uh, UK, France. Um, and me from the U.S. and a couple from Spain. And it was a lot of fun, a lot of games. And we had uh, that uh, that Donna that I'm not sure what it stands for. But it's a Spanish term for this uh, r- relentless rain that just keeps going and doesn't stop. And we've seen in Valencia uh, some of the, the tragic consequences of that. We, we had that here, not nearly um, to the same extent, it was not. Uh, I don't believe it was life threatening for anyone in the Barcelona area. But uh, today's Tuesday morning. I think there's still people who are trying to leave from Barcelona airport uh, on Sunday afternoon and are still here because the runways were flooded, flights delayed. And anyway, we were uh, out in the in the rain trying to play in that for a while. But then lightning forced us all indoors, and I I, I felt kind of bad for the families who are out for a quiet off season breakfast at a cafe on the beach and all of a sudden to have, you know, 150 sweaty, dripping ultimate Frisbee players with their gear all huddling and cramming in and talking very loudly. But uh, that's over. Um, got some good exercise that in, in there. Um, they actually sprinted. So I feel like the sprint training that I'm doing with Jay on the beach is, is paying off. Um, we're doing decreasing intervals between the runs. So 30 seconds, catch my breath, 20 seconds, 10 seconds. It's brutal um, and it seems to be working. So uh, I don't know when the next tournaments are going to be. One in February uh, in New Orleans, still thinking about. And then there's a whole bunch coming up 
in winter and spring here in Spain. That's it for this week. As always, be well, my friends.